Thank you, Devish. And I, I want to thank uh, Shenjin, Rebecca, and Jean and uh, Devish for inviting me today to give this talk, which is about uh, uh, AI for IO, which is a suite uh, of AI based tool for IO aware scheduling. And uh, uh, of course, every time we uh, work uh, and present a project, and now I'm trying to get <laughs> this slide working. Okay, that's it. Um, Every time we present work, uh, we cannot uh, forget the people that make all this possible. So here I want to start by acknowledging Michael White and Stephen O'Bine, who were my uh, former students and now are both at uh, Lawrence Livermore and my collaborator at Lawrence Livermore, uh, Kathy, Kathleen, uh, Adam, Dong and Todd. Um, the work I'm presenting is sponsored by Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, a National Science Foundation, and of course my institution. So I want to start with something that is very well known to us, which is how we submit jobs in our HPC system today. And so uh, as user, we write our job scripts uh, and we define approximately what we need for our applications. And then of course we submit these job scripts to our system. And with the hope that this job get in the queue and eventually when the resources are available, uh, this job are executed. But one thing that it's not part of our description or it is perhaps marginal. It's uh, the feature that this job have in turn in terms of IO requirements. So what we can say today is that our jobs are IO blind in the sense that uh, uh, we know that there is a shared parallel file system in our HPC system. It's shared across system, it's there, but the scheduler that we are using today, and I'm referring to SLORM in particular, do not really track the IO request uh, uh, that our jobs have. So what we say is the scheduler is IO blind. And by doing, saying that, we mean uh, there is no information about uh, occurrence of IO contention uh, and um, causes of these IO contentions. As a matter of fact, if we look at our scripts, what we see is an approximation of the time limit, the number of nodes we are using, but there is very little about the IO. So things can be uneventful if the job that we are running is, uh, can say, um, not sensitive to IO contentions. So in that case, the job run and everybody's happy. The execution of the job is uh, um, most of the time uh, meeting our expectation. But let's think about current jobs and especially job in the context of checkpointing in which regularly data have to be moved to uh, the parallel file system in the process of the checkpointing. What we have is that uh, uh, the job become IO dependent and can face issue when contentions occurs. What kind of issue? The most clear issue is that the execution of the job uh, become longer, substantially longer. And uh, um, in becoming longer, we have also what we called a uh, amount of wasted resources. Let me show you an example of what I mean for wasted resources. So here on your right, you have a uh, picture of a real experiment. This was an experiment performed on a cluster at uh, uh, Lawrence Livermore. And uh, uh, we had uh, 2,500 jobs they were running on a system that had a under provision parallel file system. So the parallel file system was not able to keep up to the request of this job. We were allocating the job to approximately almost 4,000 nodes. Some of these jobs were using multiple nodes. And uh, what we were monitoring was the um, real timing computation of these jobs. And with the assumption that a job uh, is most of the time in computation. Now, what we observed is that 
uh, as the parallel system was under provision, the real time in computation that this job were spending was substantially less than 100%. And so what does it mean that uh, this job were using the resources, but they were not doing real work, they were waiting in IO. So that is something that several of our users, especially scientists, are not aware of. And is a loss of computing that results in um, several um, events that are not wished, like termination of jobs because they become longer and they therefore overcome the limits uh, of the allocation and so on. Um, if we look at the big picture, the situation with IO contention is becoming actually a true problem. And I want to point out two aspects uh, of our system that are contributing to growing the problem of IO contention and the fact that we cannot sustain, continue ignoring these IO contentions, um, which is the first one is the widening of uh, uh, the FLOPS IO bandwidth gap. Here in this picture, you see three generation of supercomputer at Oak Ridge. And as we move from one generation to the next one, we see uh, this gap between computing power and IO uh, growing larger and larger, which means that uh, in some simulation, uh, I can run faster model, I can run more complex model, but when it is about checkpointing or saving to parallel file system, I'm in trouble because there is a major bottleneck there. The other thing I want to point out is another trend that we tend sometimes to ignore, which is that our simulation, the way in which the scientists use our supercomputer um, is becoming more and more a, uh, ensembles of job. A single simulation is an ensemble of jobs. And here you see that uh, this is a snapshot of uh, the type of jobs that are uh, has been executed in specific year on Purple, Sequoia, and Sierra. So three generation of uh, supercomputer at Lawrence Livermore. And we were counting uh, the amount of jobs that single users submit within a, uh, a week. And we were seeing that uh, users submit more and more independent jobs that are then part of the big simulation, which means more contention uh, is beyond the car behind the corner um, if these jobs are indeed requiring um, to perform substantial I.O. So where are we at the end of this introduction? Perhaps I pointed out a lot of things that for you are well known. Uh, and so I think that probably uh, you share with me uh, the fact that we need to empower schedulers with uh, IO awareness, which means that we need to have uh, tools, uh, instrumentation in our scheduler that allows them to uh, consider aspect of uh, uh, IO the, because we want to prevent. And if we are in the middle of a IO uh, um, burst, we want to mitigate. So um, what is my talk about is indeed a solution for this problem. I am presenting AI for IO, which is a suite of tools. And currently this suite of tools include two uh, main uh, tools, uh, Prion and Canario. Uh, Prion targets uh, prevention of IO contention, Canario uh, target mitigation, and their combination create uh, a first step towards uh, IO awareness in, in the scheduler that we are using. So let me start by looking at Prion first. Uh, very briefly, uh, go through the key aspect of um, that uh, are part of Prion and we think are also um, innovative. So we start with the aspect of being able to prevent IO contention. Not an easy challenge, we agree on that. 
Uh, and so the idea is that at the current time, I need somehow to identify the aspect of future IO contention and uh, reschedule the jobs uh, that are um, in my queue so that this contention is prevented. And so what we need is not only for a job to uh, estimate what is the runtime, but we also need to uh, estimate or predict what is the IO usage of a job. And so we go back to our scripts and uh, we know that user provide us some of this information, but we know also that we cannot really trust this because what we find in our script is a um, request for total time of allocation. And as you can see here in this left picture, which come also from monitoring the request of user and the true runtime of their jobs from uh, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, what you see here is that we would expect that if there is a matching, we would have a very dark diagonal, which is not the case. And we cannot blame the user to be frank, because we know that uh, um, there is this sort of prevention of job to be uh, terminated before uh, their end. And so there is this overestimation of a time just to prevent uh, a brutal termination of our jobs. So where do we start? We start with the fact that we submit a script, which is uh, repeated actually over and over with our jobs. So this idea of ensemble and jobs that have similar job scripts uh, come back to us uh, as a support for the rest of the work I'm presenting. But in any case, the job script we have, um, it starts easy to parse. It's clear what are the first couple of lines. And then as we move down uh, the scripts, we have this, uh, what we call unstructured part that become uh, job specific, application specific. And so if you want to go back and say, well, there must be information in my job that I can extract, the first step you could do is parse this uh, script. And uh, uh, with that information, the question is, what do I parse? How far do I go and collect information so that I can annotate historic jobs and then use uh, new jobs and the model, the machine learning that I've built to predict the runtime and perhaps even to predict the IO of the job. Well, this is uh, um, a very uh, intuitive approach of parsing, extracting information and try to build machine learning uh, that allow us to predict uh, uh, unknown aspect of jobs that are in the queue. Uh, the problem again is how far can I go in my parsing? How general is a parser uh, if I move from one type of jobs from one user to another? And so what if we change the way in we, we, look, we look at the script and we look at the script as uh, a, the entire script, the entire job script and at its embedded models inside the script. So every uh, letter of the script can be encoded into a vector. And so rather than parsing the script and extracting only some of the line of the script, what if we take it as it is and we transform all the uh, letter of the script into what we call an image-like job script? what you have here on your right, which is actual, actually a collection of pixel um, and that it is uh, in our case, um, come quite a piece of art you can say, <laughs> but there is a lot of informations that are embedded in this image like job script. And it is what we used uh, to look for patterns in the scripts. Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, we developed uh, uh, convolutional neural network, two-dimensional convolutional neural network that get in input uh, job scripts 
transform into an image-like representation and find this pattern for this job in term of per job uh, runtime prediction and in term of per job IO predictions, which is what we need for our IO awareness in the scheduler. And it is exactly what Prion does. It starts with the uh, uh, job scripts. It is integrated into the scheduler. And here, um, I want to sort of uh, already anticipate that the type of scheduler we are using is Flux, which is a scheduler developed at uh, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. So we integrate Prion into Flux. And so that means that we can annotate uh, existing jobs and we can use jobs that have been executed for our training. And with that information, we can predict for the job in the queue, aspect like per job runtime and per job IO usage. So traditional approach of training, validation data, the training on past job, but the output is quite interesting. So let me show you a couple of uh, results from Prion. So we start with uh, um, a, a set of experiment. We use traces from cluster at Lawrence Livermore and we compare runtime prediction, the picture on your left and IO prediction, the picture on your right for a couple of methods. When we look at the runtime prediction, we can compare the uh, prediction of runtime per job of Prion with the user uh, request and previous work we did in which we were using the traditional parsing. Um, and so what we see here is uh, uh, a box plot with uh, the um, median, 75 percentile, 95 percentile. On your right, you have the IO prediction in term of per job IO. We don't have any longer the user as a reference and we compare our accuracy in the prediction with the machine learning methods that are uh, developed based on parsing. And so, uh, this aspect of generality is not present as in Prion. And I have the citation of the paper uh, in the slide uh, that is the reference for the traditional machine learning. The key point is that um, Prion is not only giving us this freedom of uh, taking the entire script, not thinking about which line do I parse, how far do I go, so the automatic, way to look at the job script, the entire one, but it's also providing us with better performance in terms of prediction of the job runtime and the IO. So with this knowledge, it's where we can now go back to our um, scheduler and uh, empower the scheduler of this knowledge. So we are here, we are in a condition in which, uh, as you see here, it's like consider the current time of execution and without Prion, the question is, uh, where do I go? What is my IO limits? With Prion, we can uh, predict indeed, um, given the jobs in my queue, and their uh, execution, whether I will with the specific set of jobs in a specific order uh, experience uh, IO burst or, uh, or not. And of course, uh, if I expect to uh, see such an event, an IO burst, I can intervene and shuffle jobs. Now, it is not about it is happening it is not happening. It's more about given a windows of interest. Am I likely to have a IO burst inside with the type of jobs I have and their runtime and their IO request? So it's uh, um, if, to simplify it here and understand how we measure the performance of our tool. Uh, you have a uh, estimated and you have a real and uh, 
IO pattern with IO burst prediction. And what you look at is uh, anticipated windows of your prediction and see if whether the prediction with prior support are inside the real anticipated windows of IO burst. So there is this matching of it is occurring in an interval of time. It is likely to be occurring. It is not likely. With that in mind, I want to show you the results. Uh, here we were uh, using flux. We were simulating a real HPC system and the jobs on that system. And uh, we were using Prion to predict per job runtime and per job IO. And we look at uh, um, uh, precision and sensitivity of uh, our results. In terms of when we speak about precision is how many predicted IO bursts occur. And in terms of sensitivity, which is how many IO bursts are predicted. So in the picture on your right, you have a percentage of uh, bursts that uh, have been uh, observed and predicted. And on the uh, X axis, you have the uh, windows of interest, the prediction window. So of course, the smaller, the better, because that means that we are more precise in identifying whether a IO burst is occurring. Um, I show you a couple of the, the results we observed in terms of uh, precision and recall. Um, now you may say, oh, it's only 70%. Well, I think that this is actually beyond uh, the current situation, 70% is quite impressive if you consider that nowadays uh, we start with no knowledge. So um, it is a good starting point. Now, what we want to point out is that uh, uh, Prion is only one component of a tool or a set of tools that allow us to address uh, IO contention. As a matter of fact, uh, if we cannot prevent with prion, we can probably cure. And that is what we are doing with uh, Canario, which is a second tool. It's orthogonal to prion. And uh, so prion was about prediction. Uh, Canario is about mitigation as we find ourselves in uh, a um, IO contention situation, uh, and we are looking at which job am I really executing during this critical situation, we can observe that some of these jobs uh, are what we call IO sensitive. They are indeed impacted by the fact that there is uh, um, a, a large movement of data to the parallel file system. Other perhaps are not, uh, so we call them IO resistant. So what we want is uh, uh, to create a uh, integration in the schedule and expand the scheduler so that, uh, um, first of all, as we find ourselves into a uh, condition of IO contention, uh, we can differentiate between the jobs differentiate in terms of their level of sensitivity. They are, they are not. And uh, detect contention in a sense that allow us to shuffle uh, jobs, uh, postpone jobs that are IO sensitive based on our uh, projected uh, extension of this contention. Now you can say, well, uh, you are probably using the Luster uh, system um, why don't you use the log files or the information that uh, we can find in the Luster logs? Well, uh, we look at that definitely. And what we observe is that uh, um, the log files we had collected were not capturing a lot of performance degradation associated to IO. Uh, perhaps they were indicating some of them. So here is an example in which we had a performance degradation uh, that were, was observed uh, because of the parallel file system, but uh, the log file of the Luster parallel file system uh, was not indicating that. So the blue is the fact that the uh, parallel file system is up 
is working. Um, and as you see, there is not a matching. So we cannot rely exclusively on the last of logs. So what next? If we cannot rely to uh, existing tool, um, what is our approach? We started by looking at the fact that uh, already in our system, we have a monitoring job that are running. They are not running very frequently, but they are already used uh, on the system. And so we started with the uh, suggestions. What if we take what we call canary submissions? Uh, this idea of the miners that were using canary to detect gas. So what if we, in, in, in the mines, uh, and so it's for safety. Now, what if we use this same principle and we create uh, a set of IO sensitive jobs that uh, we can inject into uh, our system with the very, uh, with the frequency that is beyond one per day. So it's several, uh, at least five running at the same time on the system uh, and continuously. And what if we take this job and use the information of this job to understand whether uh, the traces that we are collecting of our jobs uh, are experiencing what we call um, a IO degradation. In other sense, if uh, this is the time goes by and we monitor our uh, canary jobs, uh, when this job experience uh, IO uh, degradation, it is because they are in a time windows of IO performance degradation. And so if we have this information for our canary jobs, we can use this information to annotate historic data uh, and differentiate them uh, between IO resistant, like in this case, you have job X that is running during an IO degradation and during a period in which there is no IO degradation and you see they have the same runtime from job that are IO sensitive. So, Every time we approach the idea of using machine learning technique, uh, and we do that in a supervised learning approach, we need to have data that are annotated to create this sort of patterns that then we are trying to predict. And so the Canario jobs allow us to annotate historic data if uh, we observed that um, the job that are running are indeed overlapping with the Canario jobs. Uh, and both of them experience uh, this IO degradation. So historical jobs are annotated and are differentiated in between IO resistant and IO sensitive. And then these data are used for our training of the machine learning model. So um, we go back to a very similar approach that was in Prion. Uh, in which we use job script that has been annotated and we uh, fed them into a forced uh, machine learning model, again, a two-dimensional convolutional neural network. Uh, this time, rather than predicting the job IO uh, we predict and the job execution, we slightly modified our convolutional neural network to predict whether the job is resistant or sensitive uh, to IO. And another uh, model we developed based again on uh, a two dimensional convolutional neural network is uh, uh, for the detection of real time IO degradation events. In this case, we have past observation windows labeled by uh, observed performance degradation, again, that we build with our canary job. And what we predict is uh, IO degradation for the current observable windows. So two models that we put uh, together to work. And this is a sort of summary of what uh, we have with the uh, canary job that are injected into uh, the system. 
And what we observe is that this allow us to annotate jobs based on their being uh, IO sensitive or IO resistant. And eventually, as we are predicting an IO contention windows, uh, we can shuffle, terminate, or move jobs that are IO sensitive and replace them from those jobs that are IO resistant. So again, the goal is to recover uh, resources and reduce uh, the time uh, that uh, individual jobs, especially those that are uh, IO sensitive, uh, spend idle waiting for IO resources. I want to show you a brief uh, snapshot of results. Again, we run this simulation with flux. Uh, and uh, what we do here, we integrate two types of uh, um, degradations that have been measured by uh, Canario. So you have a smaller one followed by a major one. And uh, this, uh, two lines are presenting uh, two information. The red one is the uh, amount of uh, uh, system node hours, so resources that we have spent to build this uh, annotation with our canary um, jobs. The blue line is uh, uh, the part that is more interesting for us, which is the node hour recovered because of canary on this system. And as you see, the first uh, IO burst is smaller, doesn't have a large uh, IO degradation, performance degradation. The second one is major. And for that, we have a reaction of the scheduler that result in something like uh, uh, 2,500 node hour of these resources that has been saved or recovered through uh, the scheduler. So um, two different point of view. Prion is about prevention. Canario is about mitigation as the contention occurs. What if we put them together? What if uh, we indeed see uh, whether their combination is helping us to extend, um, further extend so the sort of joining forces for a higher uh, resource uh, recovery. So we did that. So we look at the possibility of combining them. Um, and it is indeed the result of AI for IO. Um, and we, uh, again, uh, build our testing on uh, Flux. And uh, we compare the results of simulated uh, execution workloads without and with analytic uh, AI uh, for IO tools. So there are two sets of tests I want to briefly uh, summarize before to uh, conclude my talk. I know that I have uh, 50 minutes, so I want to get to, to the end, so I give you some time for question and discussion. Uh, so two small set. Uh, one is at the small scale, and it is more to create this visual understanding of uh, the impact of the two tools. It's about uh, 100 jobs that are uh, executed with uh, a small node, uh, so 16 node of uh, a system at Lawrence Livermore. And then we scale up and we look at a larger scale of 1,000 jobs on a 100 node uh, system, the same system, but we use more nodes. So let's start with the small um, system. And we use Flux to simulate the job on the HPC system. And this is uh, a representation of our execution of this job. Every block here is uh, um, a job, uh, different color indicates different type of uh, jobs. The green one are those that uh, complete successfully. The red one are those that are uh, terminated uh, because uh, unsuccessful because they sort of exceeded the timeline assigned to them. Uh, this is an environment that is quite unrealistic uh, because we don't have any IO contention. Uh, we don't rerun jobs. We know that user, when a job fails, tend to rerun. 
these jobs. And of course, we are not using uh, our tools, AI for IO tools uh, for this execution. Uh, but we see that it's a sort of ideal case. How much time does it take? How many of these jobs do I really uh, successfully complete? So you have here on uh, in the slide, the time, which is 1,024 minutes. And then of the 100 jobs, we have 63 that are completed. So now let's introduce aspect of realism in our uh, simulation, starting with introducing what is uh, um, IO contention. So we have a system that has a, clear, a defined IO bandwidth and uh, we inject IO burst uh, that cause uh, contentions. And so if we look at the same picture, but now you see that there is this uh, um, pink uh, background. You have three of them at, using the mouse. I hope you can see that uh, it is, uh, we see that there is a performance degradation that is quite substantial here. And then we have other two performance degradation, again, associated to injection of uh, contention. Um, what we observe here that uh, we are again, not using uh, our tools. We are not rerunning jobs. We have only contentions introduced to so one aspect of realism. We increase our make spam and we decrease the number of jobs that eventually end because now the, the degradation is causing more job to uh, exceed their time limit. So now let's inject the user behavior in this test. The user tend to, uh, when jobs are terminated uh, unexpectedly, they tend to rerun the job. And so here we are injecting the aspect of rerunning the job that are um, terminated uh, without success. And these are the um, yellow uh, boxes. Um, so in this case, as we see, we have IO contention, uh, we have rerun of jobs, we are not reusing, uh, we are not using our tools again. So again, we are still dealing with a flux that is not IO aware. And we go back and see that this change has substantially increased the make spam. Uh, and at the same time, as also address one important priority for the user, which is increase the number of jobs that has been indeed executed successfully. So last step, let's integrate Prion and uh, Canario. Let's enable Flux to become uh, IO aware. And so what we observe here are two aspects. One is that we reduce, we decrease the make spam because of the reorganization of jobs, because of the prevention of their execution. And from the point of view of the scientist, we run more job to completion. So it's a trade-off. Uh, we still experience uh, performance degradation, but uh, in this more realistic environment, we are able to return, we have a higher throughput of job execution. What happens if we move to uh, a system that is a little bit larger, so we have 1000 jobs. Uh, here we compare um, the uh, flux simulation without and with both Canario and um, uh, Prion. And we see in this case that uh, we, uh, with the use of our tools, we reduce the make spam in average of a 4.2%. Now, again, you can say, well, what is a 4.2? Where is my 20% improvement? Uh, well, we have to look at that at the big scale. And so if that is a gain, uh, of 4.2% in terms of resources means that in a system that is a large system, it results in something like 18,000 uh, uh, recovery uh, node hours. So it's not small things uh, in a data center. So uh, I want to uh, stop here uh, with uh, 
my presentation. Let's see a couple of lessons learned that uh, I hope you uh, agree with me uh, and perhaps could be a starting point for our discussion. Uh, first of all, that IO contention is a growing problem in HPC, and it is a growing problem also that impact the community that uh, address uh, checkpoint restart or checkpointing. Uh, and uh, so there is a need for tools that integrate in our scheduler some sort of IO awareness. And so I show you an example of solution in which we try to prevent through prior and we try to cure through canar Canario. Uh, both uh, have uh, uh, very uh, impactful results. If you remember with Prion, we were uh, sort of able to predict uh, uh, the uh, job, uh, the individual job IO usage uh, with a 75% mean accuracy. Uh, while we were looking at Canario, we were looking at a capability to predict, uh, differentiate jobs that are sensitive from jobs that are not sensitive. And then putting them together, having these two different orthogonal approaches, uh, result in a uh, additional, so a combination of the two, allow us to save uh, resources that otherwise would be wasted. Um, I end here. If you want to learn more about these tools, about the work, the detail of the implementations, uh, I want to share a couple of uh, uh, citations where you can find the information, or you can reach out to me and I will be very pleased to answer your questions. And I stop sharing so I can see also the people that ask me questions. But if you need to go back to any slides, I will be pleased to uh, share again my screen.